Um, but I really appreciate you being here just because it, there, it's, there's some very important conversations that have to be had. Um, I will uh, welcome everybody who is in the balcony. Um, it's a little hard to see you uh, up there, so you are more than welcome to upgrade your seats and move on down to the lower level of the lobby. Um, so because we will be having questions from the audience, it'll make it just a little bit easier um, for all of us. So if you are up there in the balcony, I see um, a couple of heads up there, uh, please feel free to move on down here. And uh, as we alluded at the very beginning of this screening, we do have um, the very talented director of The Last Resort here with us. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Vivian Bellick. So Vivian came in from Whitehorse. Yes, Whitehorse, Whitehorse today at two o'clock, and um, so she's kind of in here just especially for you guys, which is really fantastic. And so I think what we'll do is I'll kick off with a couple of questions, um, and then I will turn it over to you guys, and uh, we will go from there. If you uh, don't feel comfortable projecting to the entire group, uh, please just say your question, and um, I'll repeat it for Vivian. How, how about that? Super. Um, so tell me a little bit about how you became involved in this project. We'll start very easy. Yeah, for sure. Actually, I was going to see if there was any Tanaha members in the audience tonight. Anyway, is there? No? Okay. I was just going to check. Um, there was supposed to be some members from the community tonight. And um, anyways, I just want to acknowledge them first. I'm ask you to bring them up. Yeah, sure. To you. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I do tend to be shy with the mic. Um, yeah, so this story is a really special story that I um, that I was really happy to be a part of. Obviously, I'm, I'm not from BC, and I'm obviously not Tanaha myself, but um, I was approached by Hot Docs about six months ago to um, help out with this compilation, and so we were actually looking for stories in the north. And while we were searching, um, this story kind of hit us in the face, and it was one that we really couldn't... Um, I guess avoid. It was a really fascinating story. It's a really landmark case that, as you know, still hasn't been decided upon. And as someone who lives in the Yukon and um, you know uh, is constantly surrounded by in indigenous issues and land issues, it was a, um, a story that myself and my team. So I just want to acknowledge my team as well. They're not here with me. My producer, um, and then my other crew, half of who are from the Yukon and indigenous themselves, and others who are not. But. Um, uh, it was it was a story to us that was really fascinating um, because often these sorts of land issues are fought on Section 35 of the Constitution, which is um, duty to consult. And so this was a really interesting story because it was the first time that we had seen a First Nation um, fighting to protect their land on freedom of religion. And so. Uh, it's a potentially very fascinating case because what happens from this case will affect Indigenous people, not only in Canada, but potentially around the world. Um, and so when that, when we, you know, unfortunately we caught up with the case right after um, it had been presented before the Supreme Court, so we weren't able to go to Ottawa and we weren't able to follow the First Nation as they went there. Um, but it, it, you know, it's a very fascinating time and what we wanted to do was show a slice of, of life for this community that has been um, thinking about this and battling this for, for 25 years. Um, so that was, I guess, the hope with this film was to really show a snapshot of um, what, I guess, the, the charter in this case, how it's affecting this community and, and what it means, um, you know, because our charter now really doesn't uh, protect Aboriginal people um, in, in specific ways um, that, that it could be. So. Uh, it is kind of lacking some of those protections. So, yeah, I hope I answered that question. Yeah, that's great. And I think the charter isn't really uh, easy. I think we hear about the charter, but it's also a lot to kind of digest and unpack a little bit. And you were kind of given like a short film. So here's like 20 something minutes. And um, it's not a small topic. And they're like, go, okay, make sense of it. And. I think it's really hard to make it kind of digestible for audiences, but like as you saw, it was treated like so respectfully, um, but at the same time, kind of highlighted some of like the very key issues. I know that there's so much more in depth that you could really go for it, uh, but what kind of what was your approach for that, and how did you make it digestible as a filmmaker and a storyteller? Yeah, it was really challenging because you know there there was 25 years that um, we weren't able to show, and then also I'm sure a lot of you know of the jumbo. Um, 
the, <laughs> I'm forgetting the name of the documentary, it's on Netflix, um, about the Jumbo Ma Mountain Resort. And so there, a lot of this conversation had already been talked about and we didn't want to replicate what was happening. Um, and so we really want to focus on the indigenous story um, of the Tanaha and then also this, this court case, which wasn't really featured in, in um, the, the Jumbo documentary. So um, that was, I guess, what our challenge was. And, th and then really it was just, um, you know, it, it, in a sense it does feel different. I mean, all the films in this compilation feel really different, which is really interesting, you know, that they all kind of uh, have a different style and a different feel. Um, this one, you know, was, was a bit of a slower, more subtle, I guess, look at the community. Um, and that was part of it, was that um, for me, you know, as an outsider going into that community, um, learning about what's happening, it, a lot of things are quite subtle and it takes time and, um, yeah, it, you know, I think in our in our society when we, you know, I think, you know, as opposed to maybe um, an indigenous community, things are spoken uh, aloud quite uh, readily. And and as an outsider walking, our crew walking to that community, you know, it took a lot of time and trust to build that relationship and, and things weren't readily shared with us. And there was a lot of things that, you know, you know weren't in the film. And, um, and yeah, so I think it was, yeah, I guess in a way it was a challenge to to try to get that across and to try to get some of those subtleties across. And um, yeah, hopefully some of that did come across in the film. And um, yeah, talking about spirituality is not an easy thing. And I think for Indigenous folks who have had their spirituality stripped away from them, um, it's even more difficult. So, you know, there there is an irony, I think, that um, they're having to now go to court and uh, and and try to protect that. So. Yeah. I think it was uh, really interesting, like towards the end, uh, Troy, and I know he wanted to be here, but he couldn't yeah. be, uh, he kind of talked about, it's not about um, the Supreme Court giving back the rights to the people, but it's about the Supreme, Supreme Court giving the rights uh, back to Canadians, because it's about awareness, and we already have protected that, and that culture kind of gets trans. Uh, ascended and uh, passed on from generation to generation. And I guess, how could we create uh, awareness on a larger scale? So outside of the community, um, in terms of like respect and how we, we talk about it or how we even approach it, or uh, I guess even how we champion it. Yeah. Um, because I think like democracy shouldn't only be for uh, one group of people or a limited group of people, it should be for everybody. And so how do we uh, apply that kind of on a larger scale and what can we do? audience members yeah well I mean I can I can only speak for myself in terms of being part of this film and and not being an indigenous person and not being a Tanaha member and um, you know like there were certainly uh, moments of discomfort for myself and the folks in my crew who were not indigenous in having to have some of these conversations that um, yeah, I think as a country that we're all coming to start to talk about reconcili reconciliation and what does that mean and you know how do we actually do that? Um, yeah, because it, it can be really an uncomfortable thing at times. Um, and so I think uh, yes, it's you know it's 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 something as as a country that we all need to be talking about whether we're indigenous or not because we're all we're all part of this story and uh, it's actually interesting watching this film here in BC versus in Toronto two weeks ago. I actually feel like um, it, it's kind of neat. I feel like it sort of resonated maybe a little bit more on the West Coast. I mean, obviously all these places are in, in your backyard, um, but as someone who lives on the West Coast as well and the Yukon, like I think we think about these kinds of issues a lot more than maybe in Ontario and um, um, or maybe I'm just wishfully thinking that <laughs> people were understanding it a little bit, a little bit more here. But I think there really is a, um, more of an understanding on the West Coast. We we do talk about these issues a lot more, and I think that um, it's important that we keep doing it. You know, I had moments where there was a lot of discomfort. Um, yeah, like being being part of this story, and even though we did have a lot of cooperation with the First Nation, um, in terms of how this this story was being told and how we were approaching the community. Um, you know, there was like back and forth and in, in then seeing some of the cuts and that kind of thing, which isn't always that usual, I guess, on a, on a documentary. And so it was it was important for us, though, that the First Nation uh, felt like it was reflective. Um, and yeah, and I think that that's, I guess, something that we all need to do. You know, Troy, it's too bad he's not here tonight. He's so great. <laughs> um, and he speaks so great to, you know, to this cause. But um, 
yeah, it, it's about having those uncomfortable conversations. So I think we just need to be willing to, to go to those places. And I think like you guys touched upon it exactly because like I think sometimes we can say like reconciliation and we feel uh, good about it. We pat ourselves on the back like, oh, we're doing the right thing. But I think like Jeff mentioned in the movie, uh, it's definitely, it's kind of a feeling and it should never be about, oh, good for you. Um, I think it has to be something that is very conscious in terms of um, how we are treating the issues and uh, what we are being, how we are being equitable across the board. Um, I will ask, and I don't know if this is a question you know, but has anything happened in terms of the court case? I know you're hoping for a, kind of like a ruling in 2017, but since you've made the film, I know it hasn't been a ton of time, uh, but have been, there been any updates that didn't make the cut? Well, first I'm just actually going to point out Jeff in the audience if he doesn't mind. So Jeff is the lawyer that was in the film. He's <laughs> standing in the second back. You just want to wave your hand. Um, yeah, it was really wonderful uh, <laughs> having you a part of the film. Um, anyways, I thought his approach to um, yeah working with the, the community was yeah is like very inspirational. Um, but to answer your question, I there there hasn't been anything that has come forward, and so you can jump in, Jeff, and correct me. But um, from my understanding, the ruling will just come down immediately, and it'll just get put online. There won't be any sort of um, uh, kind of heads up to the community, is that correct? They, they usually give a little bit of a heads up to the community or to the um, to the parties involved. Mm -hmm. um, but then uh, it's my understanding that things are on lockdown and then it's publicly released. Okay. So you're sort of right. Okay. So. This is the legalist. <laughs> <laughs> my lawyer friends in the front are laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. And um, I want to throw it to the audience. I have a couple more questions. I'll throw it to the audience first to make sure we get all of your questions in. Does anybody have a question for Vivian? Yes, at the back. If the cause isn't supported at the highest level of intangible, are they thinking to go to the UN or is there really another resort? Um, did anyone did everyone hear that question? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, to my understanding, there is no other recourse. So that is the, the highest court in the land. Um, and so yeah, basically, what what happens to that case will, I guess, set a precedent in Canada at least. But I think, the, and Jeff, of course, please jump in. Um, but I think it will have some sort of like ripple effects internationally. Is that true? I don't think that they can go to the UN though and, and get anything. Beyond that, is that correct? These cases are so unusual when they deal with um, indigenous connections to land and spirituality that um, the Canadian, the uh, Supreme Court of Canada would be looking at what's going on in the United States, what's going on in New Zealand, Australia, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll have ripple effects. Okay. Yes. Is that French. There's two. I don't know who to go to first. Go ahead. Uh, I think your inclusion of uh, the Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin's uh, mispronunciation of the First Nations, uh, their, their, their nation's name, uh, was very poignant and very specific. Uh, and I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it was, it was interesting, actually, because when I... Um, when I reached out to Troy at first, I know that I had obviously read the name Tanaha, and I had also, like Beverly McLaughlin, said Kutanaksa, and um, but I made sure when I was telephoning Troy for the first time that I knew how to pronounce it because I was so nervous that I didn't want to mess it up, and so I was so shocked to see that Supreme Court footage to see you know someone who's so respected. Um, like Bev McLaughlin to mess it up, and she she actually did it a couple times. So I just showed that one time, um, but then she obviously mispronounced um, the the chair of the Tanahas, name Catherine Denise, and so it was like adding insult to injury. Um, and you know it was something that almost all the people that I talked to pointed out, and I think that it's such a subtle but like very clear indication of um, disrespect. Um, you know, because they have so many people that work beneath them. Um, you know, it's like a legion of, um, uh, you know, clerks and that sort of thing that help out. And like, that's the smallest 
thing that you could do to, to at least make a nation feel welcome at such an intimidating place for anyone um, is at least pronounce their name correctly. And so I think that was like, to them, that was such an insult. Yeah. I'm glad that you noticed that. Yeah. <laughs> it was very obvious in the film. I think we had a question next. Um, I was left wondering about, um, so this nation is making a, a claim under the, under the freedom of religion, and yet they have been so oppressed under the name of religion. And I wonder if any of the people that you spoke to in making your film saw a risk of being successful in a under their uh, making a making a claim under their religious rights if they saw a risk of that um, same right being claimed by someone else of another religion who might who had in the past used their religious rights and their religious beliefs to oppress those same people. Like if there was if that sort of dichotomy wrote was raised ever by any of the people you spoke to? Um, no, it's interesting. That wasn't. Um, I know certainly there was uh, like business groups and lobby groups that raised concerns, obviously, about if this case were to be successful, what it would mean for other, you know, potential areas of land in the country. Um, but no, actually, no one did bring that up, which is interesting, right? Because it also opens the door for other um, spiritual and religious groups to yeah to make claims and potentially ones that would wouldn't be so beneficial to them yeah is that something that Jeff has thought about <laughs> Jeff have you thought about that at all the, the honest thing was that I got so caught up with your question that I was thinking about something else which is the pain and it came out from uh, Chad Luke the gentleman who was there yeah. in probably his living room quite emotional, the pain that people feel speaking about um, matters that are supposed to be kept secret. The people that, that spoke about these things for the court case, um, and this is, I guess, public because it's in the evidence, have taken great risks. So I'm sorry I got caught up with that and I didn't hear the whole question. But just, just to complete the half sentence, just half sentence, they took such risks, um, as I understand it, on many realms, in many realms. They took great physical risks, um, just revealing what they revealed. But, so I didn't hear the whole question, I'm sorry. You revealed something about my question in answering it. Mm -hmm. I see that as Westerners, we don't take any risks talking about our spirituality. Uh, the the Judeo Judeo Christian um, faith doesn't have any problem talking about its faith and talking about its spirituality. We've had no problem sort of laying it on on most of the world, and I wonder if there is um, a risk of taking some small and precious spiritual tradition to protect a mountain, how that precedent might be perverted or used um, in a world where we've basically taken like a, 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 a Christian Calvinist ethos to create capitalism. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we're like the other spirit, the, the dominant spiritualities in the world um, could so easily use um, a finding that someone had a spiritual right to a place to dominate places. And I wonder if that's something that was thought about. It's already been found, and it's all in other courts in the world. It's just time for Canada to get there. And it hasn't been misused yet in those other places. But somehow the answer I'm thinking comes with what Troy was saying, where he was talking about it's well, how did you put it? That it wasn't just that the Supreme Court would be giving 
the right or recognizing that the Tanaka have a part in the, in the charter, but that he would be giving, or that the Supreme Court would be giving the right to Canadians to start having these conversations to recognize that within Judeo-Christian traditions, we do have secretive parts of them, or things, certain knowledge, sacred knowledge that is not to be shared except when somebody's ready. We've lost our own connection to land. What could we learn from the Supreme Court of Canada decision that recognizes that? And even if they don't, God forbid, pardon the use of the term, God forbid. Unintended. <laughs> what can we learn from the Tunasa and others like them who um, continue on? When Vivian interviewed me, when Vivian interviewed me, I cried. Yeah. And I can't stop myself with this case. What can we learn from these people? They've already given us so much. Vivian talked about the challenge and the, the uncomfortable places. You answered that so beautifully. To get to uncomfortable places in the conversation. The Supreme Court of Canada can do that, but the Tuna has already done it for us. It's, it's kind of a gift. Do we pick it up or don't we? Sorry to ramble. I think. I'm not sure I've answered. It. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really, that was really great and uh, really beautiful. And uh, absolutely, I think that there's I think that there's something um, to be said about those. It, it is like a, it's not just a sacred space, but it's also sacred conversations. And that's really important to recognize. Um, and I know that you only interviewed like a very small um, number of people from the community, but I don't know if um, you had more interactions with Tanaha people and uh, if they shared more about like that spiritualism and those stories and where they're like, it's almost sad to be like, I appreciate what you're doing, but it's also sad to be like, we need somebody else to almost like tell our stories. And I feel like people should be listening regardless. Like we shouldn't have to create documentaries to be doing, to have these conversations. And yet that's something um, that has to happen. That's not really a question. Um, but how do, I guess, do you think that there's a point in which we will be able to move away from that and in which um, those stories and traditions and history and culture will be cherished in and of themselves um, without, and this is a, totally the wrong word without like outside aids that's the to like not the right word for it um but will we ever get to that point and jeff feel free to uh jump in if you would like yeah um i mean that's tricky for me to answer because obviously i am outside and at such a short window of time to get to know the community i think jeff spent a lot more time with them and um yeah, I think that even me coming in and asking questions was difficult because, um, again, it was like breaking that um, this sacred kind of space. And um, and I think for the Tanaha, they've been going about their spirituality, um, you know, in their community on their own for so many years, thousands of years. Um, obviously, you know, with the disruption in the last, you know, couple hundred years, but. Um, it's again, it's different. It's like, you know, Justine was saying, you know, we're in this culture today, we're so quick to be able to, in Judeo Christian culture, talk about our religion and the Tanaha. Um, that was something that was extremely difficult in telling this story was how do I tell this story about a community of people that don't want to publicly share what their spirituality is? It's so sacred to them that even talking about it will kind of break that, that sacredness. And I think for them, it was like, we don't need to talk, we don't need to talk about it. We don't need to be on social media doing all that. Like, we believe in it, and that's enough. Like, we don't need, like, so I mean, even the fact that I was coming to, like, do this story, you know, it's probably kind of strange. I mean, it was already out there because of the court case, but it's almost, like, redundant for them. They're like, we don't need to prove this. We already know it. Um, yeah, so, I, what do you think, Jeff? Does that kind of... <laughs> That, well, uh, again, God forbid, 
God forbid we don't need films like this. It's beautifully done. But, but we can get to that place where we don't need, as you say, outside aids or whatever mm -hmm. term you use. We don't need those if we're willing to take the personal risks, if we're willing to get to very uncomfortable places um, and have those conversations or even not have those conversations and talk less and listen more. I think that's, that's really great to listen more. Very, um, very, very poignant and very, very accurate, 100%. Was there any additional questions in the audience? Yes. Um, the difference in the um, maybe, uh, you know, not being open to going into that community, how has it changed you over mm -hmm. the course of time in the process of making the film? Okay. Yeah. Did everybody hear that? Just <laughs> the question was, how has making the film changed Vivian, um, especially like learning about all of this and uh, not originally being part of the community, um, how has that changed you, I guess, moving forward? Yeah, I mean, um, it was like incredibly special to be part of this project because, um, yeah, I mean, it was also a really uncomfortable time to be doing this story as a non-Indigenous person, although my producer is Indigenous and uh, one of the folks on the crew is also Indigenous, so they're Dene. Uh, from the north and so that was really great and living in the north as well like there's a very strong indigenous presence and i've been uh i used to work as a journalist up there and so that was a good way for me to immerse myself in indigenous issues but um, as an outsider it was actually incredibly difficult especially in the last six months with uh, you know the conversations that have been going on um in canada and, you know um certainly like what right do i have to be telling this story and um, that was something that I did struggle with, but yeah, I think I think that it doesn't, you know, I think I briefly, maybe I was talking about it with Jeff or someone else, that, you know, necess you know, even though you, you aren't Indigenous, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't listen and also um, really take the time to, to understand where, you know, the other person is coming from. And so that was a lot of like what I spent. It was actually like incredibly, I think, um, influential because I really like on on top of I guess someone who always wants to like understand where people are coming from because I was an outsider. There was like this added pressure um, to like really understand uh, the, the the community and, and to get the story right because you know. Um, you know, I, I'm not of the community, and and that was so important to me to make sure it was like reflective. So um, yeah, I think you know, and, and and going forward, I may not even ever tell another indigenous story because I feel like maybe I'm not in the right to do that. So it's it's interesting. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe Jeff, you want to jump in as well. Like, um, I know that there was one person on your legal team that was First Nation, but the rest wasn't. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah so, how was that, you know, for for you guys to represent the Tanaha? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to begin. I don't know how to begin. Take too long. Yeah. Um, I, I just I just wanted to echo, um, what a great job you did with it. Um, I think that there was a respectfulness. I think that there was a stillness to the film, which can be really hard um, in this day and age when everything is uh, competing for our attention to show, I think, um, restraint and respect. And I think that you did that really well. And um, I just want to congratulate you for that. And I hope that uh, what comes out of it is more powerful than just the screening, and I hope what comes out of it is more powerful, um, e even more powerful than what happens at the Supreme Court uh, the ruling. And uh, I wanted to thank you for that and for taking your time um, to come out here and to share this story with us, um, but also to share some of the insights that you've had along the way. And it really, uh, it really means a lot. And what an incredible way to kind of end off this 
uh, showcase, so I wanted to thank you. And so I'm going to also ask all of you if you could just join me um, in thanking you. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. You guys have been an incredible audience. The West Coast is uh, really one of my favorite communities, and I'm so glad um, that I had the opportunity to kind of spend the last couple of uh, days with you guys. So thank you so much. Um, Tom Charity is not here, but he is a programmer for um, Van City and Fifth, and he did want to let me tell me to he did tell me to let you know that the um, additional. Uh, calendar dates and, and film screenings are available now, so please make sure you check and continue to support your community theater. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great night.